You'll be a one-term president because you've already served, yeah. so you can only serve for one term, although they yeah. say you'll never leave office, I assume. Uh, yeah, that, you'll do. never leave. There'll never be an ele another say, election don't again. don't do it. He'll never leave. He's yeah. never going. Oh, these people. They um, are crazy. So for that reason... Well, you heard it straight from the horse's mouth, folks. Trump is not going to try to become a dictator or abuse power. And of course, he's going to leave office after his term ends. And quite frankly, the people who think otherwise are downright crazy, as he said, because, I mean, he's given us really no indication that he tried to illegally stay in power after his term ends. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength. Might have forgot about that, though. But that moment from Trump's Fox News town hall occurred during a conversation about who is potentially going to be his running mate and we're going to talk about that but much like the sean handy town hall laura ingram kept trying to get him to reassure voters that he's not going to abuse power or become a dictator but as you're going to see getting trump to stay on topic is like trying to herd cats it's near impossible but let me show you what i mean by that i know you have suffered endless attacks no doubt but how can you assure independent and undecided voters that your focus as president will be on improving the state of our country and not settling those old scores. <laughs> it's an interesting question, I must say. <laughs> Look, I did it before. We had a great four years, especially before that very last part where COVID came in, and we did a great job there. We've been given great uh, marks on the economy and on the military and on foreign. And Trump then rambles on for more than a minute after that about the amazing job that he did and meanders endlessly until Laura Ingram finally tried to get him back on track and address the actual question that that lady asked. We're doing better than any. But the question about score settling, a lot, a lot of women, you know, they don't, a lot of women voters, they don't like the name calling. They don't like the score settling. They just, they love your policies and they just want Trump's policies, maybe not so much of the other stuff. So I think that's what the, the question, well, no, if but, you don't mind my asking, I think that's what she's getting well, at. But I, but but also, you want to say, how do you get together? We're going to get together through success. When this country, the country was at a level that we've never, we had the best employment numbers in history. Everything was good. And this country was coming together. Then we got hit with COVID. But this country came together. Uh, I don't care about the revenge thing. I know they usually, usually use the word revenge. Will there be revenge? Uh, my revenge will be success. Well, I'll be damned. He actually answered the question. Hmm. It is possible. Now, if he didn't whine so much about his own persecution and didn't already promise to pursue revenge in his second term, I'd say that's a pretty reasonable way to address the question of how a president can bring Americans together. Economic success is a great unifier. But let's be real. Presidents don't have as much control over the economy as Americans think they do, and Trump wasn't concerned about helping ordinary Americans. In fact, he was vehemently against labor rights, and he had no interest in raising the minimum wage and doing anything to alleviate people with student loan debt, and not to mention his signature policy achievement was tax cuts for him and his rich friends. So all of this chatter about how wonderful the economy was under Trump was a narrative created specifically by economic elites in the media who also benefited from his tax cuts. But for most people, People, things didn't actually feel much better. And the reason why it felt that way is because it was that way. Maybe some Americans felt more optimistic because of the stock market doing better, which is great for 401ks if you have one, but a lot of people don't have one. But for most people, when he was president, shit didn't change. Americans continued to live paycheck to paycheck while Republicans and pundits talked at us about how great the economy was doing when we didn't feel it. And to be fair, all politicians do this. Trump is al isn't alone here. Biden does the same thing as well, even though though now a lot of people are struggling after the COVID era stimulus policies have expired. But if a president really did want to unify this country, Trump is correct that the collective economic success of everyone would be one way to do it. But let's not pretend that he's interested in doing that at all. Trump is a petty bitch. And of course, he's going to seek vengeance rather than lifting all of us up during a second term. But I want to go back to the VP talk because one of the potential names being discussed here is Tim Scott, who was at this town hall. And even though Trump is trying to compliment him, I think this was one of the most degrading things I've ever seen. He's been so great. He's been such a great advocate. I, I have to say, I don't, this is in a very positive way, Tim Scott. He has been much better for me than he was for himself. I watched his campaign <laughs> and he doesn't like talking about himself, but boy, does he talk about Trump. And I said, you know, I called him. I said, Tim, you're better for me than you were for yourself. 
but he's fantastic and he's a fantastic person. Uh, so no, I want somebody in. that can Someone be. who can step into the role. Yes, Laura, of course I'm basing my choice off of their qualifications and their ability to lead and not how much ass kissing they're doing. But I mean, Tim Scott, is this really what you want to be doing right now? Pathetically groveling at the feet of a fascist by degrading yourself for a chance at power? You really want to do this? I mean, I just find this so humiliating. No amount of money or power could get me to do that, could get me to become a sycophant on that level to anyone. It's just embarrassing. And look, I hate to say it, but I kind of felt bad for Tim Scott just in the sense that like I felt secondhand embarrassment for him, but I really shouldn't feel bad because, I mean, when somebody subjects themselves to that, we really shouldn't have sympathy because this is what he wants. This is all worthwhile if he gets power. It's just shameful. But I do want to move on to other portions of the town hall. And uh, nothing that I'm about to show you is particularly shocking or ominous. But these clips, I think, best encapsulate the stupidity of Trump and how utterly exhausting it is. For example, when he was talking about Navalny, he threw in a random comment that is genuinely idiotic. And it's not like he hasn't said this before, but for some reason, him saying it this time triggered me. But let me show you and I'll tell you what I mean. But it's happening in our country, too. Uh, we are turning into a communist country in many ways. And if you look at it, I'm the leading candidate. I got indicted. I never heard of being indicted before. I was going to. I got indicted four times. I have eight or nine trials, all because of the fact that I'm and you know this all because of the fact that I'm in politics. Oh, that's why you're indicted, because you're in politics, right? It's not because you tried to illegally overturn the results of a Democratic election or anything. No, it's because he's in politics. Well, by that logic. If you're like Navalny and Democrats are like Putin and they're needlessly prosecuting their political opponents, why wouldn't they also prosecute other political opponents, Republicans like Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis? Why just you? It's because Trump has the worst case of main character syndrome that I've ever seen, and it doesn't matter what the circumstance or scenario is. He's always the victim in that predicament, okay? So even though in this anecdote here, Putin, Navalny, he would be Putin, he's comparing himself to Navalny because, well, his actions actually led to him seeing consequences for the first time. Maybe, I mean, we don't even know if he's going to be convicted. He's indicted, 91 counts, but... He's an elite. He could get away with it, right? But even the prospect of accountability for him, it's something that he can't stand. Even before he was indicted, while he was president, literally the most powerful person on the planet, he still pretended to be the victim. So this isn't necessarily anything new for Trump, and the self-pity isn't even the part that bothered me the most about that clip. The part that bothered me the most is when he claimed that we're becoming a communist country in many ways. Now, yes, I understand that Trump does not know what communism means, obviously, and he is using communism as a synonym for authoritarianism. But when you say we're becoming a communist country, the opposite is true. We are a late stage capitalist country and we're probably going to see flying cars before we see communism in this country. That is, of course, assuming we don't go extinct due to climate change. But I mean, we're not communist. But Trump has made this a trend in the United States where you say the opposite of what's true. And if everybody just says it, then I guess at some point enough people start to believe it. I hate that. But regardless, let's move on. So on the subject of climate change, Trump is going to complain about the efforts to transition to more sustainable technology. And um, just just watch. Do you believe the push to control um, gas stoves, you know, how far you could drive by forcing people into electric vehicles, all the, the, the new edicts that they really want to push out? What's really behind that? Do you believe there's a, a bigger agenda to kind of control movement, control people's freedom of movement? Well, a lot of people said that. I'm not sure. I, I just think they maybe are just mixed up or confused. They come out with uh, faucets where no water comes out. You know, if you go and buy a home and they know what I mean, the showers, you stand under a shower and there's no water coming and you're saying you're, you end up standing there five times longer. Have you considered trying to turn the faucet all the way on? Maybe you're only turning it on a little bit. Nevertheless, continue. Uh, but they want that. They want they want the well, dishwasher to be everything. changed. The all of that is part of the agenda. So in Ohio, you have a great company that came to me, the dish, a dishwasher company, one of the biggest and finest companies. But they were going out of business. They said we're not allowed to use water. 
Well, the Democrats banned us from using water, so I guess it's time to close up shop, guys. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna go home because we can't use water anymore. Damn, it's gonna be really unfortunate when we want to drink water, but we can't use it. Democrats said so. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the level of stupidity on display here is just so exhausting to me mentally physically i just can't take it and people will respond saying well mike you're being uncharitable because he's obviously referring to regulatory changes when it comes to water and the limitation of use but no no, no. i don't actually believe that i think that he, he literally believes that the dishwashing company is not allowed to use water and they had to go out of business as a result of democrats saying no more water i, I mean come on we're dealing with a potential dementia patient who suffers from delusions of grandeur that thinks he won the last election so of course when a dishwashing company complains to him potentially if this even happened about the limitation of water usage or perhaps prices increasing of course he's going to take that as oh democrats said no more water period full stop because it's trump we're dealing with here now i've got one last clip to show you so he makes up a lie about mail-in voting and is immediately contradicted by laura ingram but he just keeps going and pretends like he doesn't hear her forget the past what are you going to do to make sure we don't have problems going forward if you have mail-in voting you automatically have fraud. If you have- Okay, well, there's mail-in voting in Florida That's and you right. won huge. That's right. If you have it, you're going to have fraud. But you won. Because you don't have any- Now, before you give Laura Ingram too much credit, she was also conspiracy mongering and concern trolling about election fraud as well. But she did point out the fact that Trump was still able to win in states with mail-in voting, despite his claims of fraud, which kind of throws a whole wrench in his argument that mail-in voting leads to fraud, unless we assume that he himself is committing fraud in states with mail-in voting. But that's not the case. He's- Full of shit, as we all know. But I mean, that's all that I really have to say about this town hall. There's a lot more that I could talk about, but I'm going to cut it off right here because any more will lead to more brain rot. But I mean, it's February and I've already hit peak Trump fatigue. And I actually kind of regret talking about this town hall now that we're at the end of the video because I, I feel brain rot. Like, I feel like I lost multiple IQ points in the process of preparing for this video and then talking about this video and listening to Trump. I think it's just genuinely bad for my mental health. And uh, I regret doing it. So uh, I guess you're welcome, viewers. You made me do this. Penis and balls, vagina. Pe pe penis and balls, vagina. Pe pe P word and balls, vagina. Pe pe P word and balls, vagina. A ass, gum. Ass, gum. Ass, gum. Vagina. She stroked my face with the vagina. She stroked my penis and balls.